without much further ado, um, I would like to um, uh, move across um, to the beginning of the, the session. And it is a great pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, Dr. Lizanne Henderson. Um, Lizanne, whom I've known for um, a great many years now, um, but it's the first time I've introduced her um, at a conference. Um, Lizanne is Senior Lecturer in History in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, based at the University of Glasgow's Crichton campus down in Dumfries, and is well known to many of us as a scholar of early modern Scottish folk belief. From her interdisciplinary first degree studies in history and fine art at Guelph in Ontario, progressing through a postgraduate MA in folklore at Memorial University of Newfoundland in St John's, to her PhD in history and Scottish studies from Strathclyde, Lausanne has pursued an academic career that has woven together many of these disciplinary strands. Now, the interdisciplinary strength is evident in her teaching, where she's lectured on themes as diverse as cultural history, witchcraft, folklore and critical animal studies, Scottish expeditions and explorers, the transatlantic slave trade and emigration, with a focus on Europe, North America, the Arctic and Australia. Our publications cover many of these topics, from the 2018 article about a bear, wildlife tourism in the polar north, and the 2016 monograph, um, Witchcraft and Folk Belief in the Age of Enlightenment, Scotland 1670 to 1740, to a 2008 article on Southwest Scottish connections to the slave trade. Lausanne's interest in expedition and explorers led to, and has been reinforced by, her regular invitations as a speaker and guide on expedition ships around the British Isles, the Canadian Arctic, Greenland, Iceland, the Faroes, Norway and Spitsbergen. One of her current projects, Picturing Polar Bears, which is a study into the cultural history, artistic depictions and semiotic uses of the polar bear in environmental education, was stimulated by these experiences. And that leads neatly into the subject of Lausanne's paper this afternoon. Some valuable notices of the habits of the animals, perceptions and observations of animals by 19th century Scottish Arctic explorers. Lausanne. Thank you very much, Richard, for that very <laughs> fulsome um, introduction. I'm just going to attempt to share my presentation with you. So hopefully you can see that now. You can let me know if there's a problem. So just as uh, Richard was explaining, the, uh, the subject for what I've prepared for today uh, feeds into my interdisciplinary um, approaches to a lot of different topics that I, that I cover. So this one will be looking at, I suppose, more the environmental humanities and human animal studies approaches uh, with a particular focus on the Scottish Arctic explorer, Sir John Richardson from Dumfries. This discussion forms part of a wider uh, investigation that I'm currently undertaking on, um, on human animal interactions and perceptions of the natural world in Arctic and subarctic contexts, building on work that I've previously started on uh, the Arctic explorer John Ray, who may be uh, a little more familiar to you than, than Richardson, uh, the Orcadian, and uh, that work has been published now uh, as incidents of great importance. And if you're interested in that, you can by all means get in touch and I'll, I'll forward you the, a copy of the article. What I was attempting to do in that particular article was to discuss Ray's observations, perceptions and representations of animals and what they might reveal about his attitudes and mindset, um, as well as that of some of his contemporaries. And today's discussion is, I suppose, an extension of that topic, bringing in John Richardson into sharper focus. So what follows is very much work in progress, and so I would greatly value your comments and suggestions. Now, uh, interest from uh, Scotland in Arctic exploration really intensifies in the 19th century, forming part of, of the wider British process of discovery exploitation and colonial expansion, reaching back, uh, really back to the 16th and 17th centuries, but we'll not be going back that far. Uh, in the context of the 19th century, which is, could be seen as the height of British colonialism, um, bred a sense of superiority 
over the indigenous populations of these new worlds, who were not unlike the animals, uh, to be, seem to be conquered, to be used and exploited. Many of these adventurers were searching for a route through the Arctic Ocean via the Northwest Passage out towards the Beaufort Sea. And uh, some were going the other direction, though I'm not talking about that today, uh, towards the Bering Strait through the Northeast Passage. The lure of profitable trade with the Far East was a very strong motivation behind these excursions, but the Arctic itself was revealed to be a source of great economic wealth uh, in its own right, particularly in terms of its minerals, its fur animals, its ivory and its whales. The Arctic was also increasingly valued as a source of new scientific discovery and the expansion of knowledge about uh, the natural world. Journals and diaries kept on um, Arctic expeditions often included notes and observations of the animal life. And by mid-century, in the wake of Darwinian revelations regarding evolutionary um, uh, biology, um, with his famous work on the origin of species of 1859, there arose a, a crisis of faith and a challenge to religion, as humans were asked to face the prospect that they were not as unique um, as they had once been led to believe. Now, in the context of uh, environmental humanities, a question that has arisen in, in recent years, and largely due to, uh, uh, can, I suppose, wider awareness of anthropogenic climate change, is that the traditional disciplinary divide between history and natural history is no longer as clearly defined as it once was, and is, is perhaps in need of redefinition. And to be fair, uh, this, is, this does happen, uh, especially within the realm of environmental history. But what should history include? As Benjamin Morgan has recently argued, um, and he was specifically looking at William Scoresby's account of the Arctic regions of 1820, which was a very popular, it still remains a very popular text, quite a captivating tale of adventure um, and uh, depictions of the whaling life. How should one, says Morgan, approach the scientific data that Scoresby also includes um, on things like climate and you know, you know, meteorological tables and whatnot. Following Deepesh Chakrabarti's proposal that anthropogenic explanations of climate change spell the collapse of the age-old humanist distinctions between natural history and human history, which in turn builds on Aldo Leopold's statement um, in 1949 that, that many historical events hitherto explained solely in terms of human enterprise were actually biotic interactions between people and land. And so Morgan pursues this line of reasoning and asks if natural and climatological events are historical agents, then the boundary separating Scoresby's record of the temperature from his record of Arctic adventure becomes less evident. Is it possible, in other words, to understand are objects of study as inhabiting not only human time and culture, but also the non-human space and time of the planet, the climate or weather. Now the object of our inquiry today are the animals, which in many 19th century Arctic accounts, um, including Richardson's um, and indeed John Ray's, are presented to us as scientific data. But is it possible as Aldo said, to read these as biotic interactions, um, you know, interactions between explorer and an animal, rather than just explorer as collector of facts. And the place of animals um, in the story of polar uh, observation and exploration has been largely peripheral, concerned mostly with the animal as a commodity, as a source of sustenance, um, or uh, an object of scientific um, inquiry. Now what I'm interested in is if there is something beyond the usual, uh, perhaps tired narrative of human dominion over the animals. If human-animal relationships, as they were experienced in this case by Scottish polar explorers, reveals anything more about their understanding of the natural world, 
but also perhaps uh, about themselves and, uh, and obliquely their sense of identity. Now, the primary sources that I have used are uh, printed texts uh, from the first half of the 19th century, namely Richardson's four volume Fauna Boreali Americana, of 1829 to um, 1837, and his two-volume uh, Arctic Searching Expedition uh, from 1851. And uh, though not directly discussed today, um, has also been informed by John Ray's narrative of 1850. And uh, there's been many influences on methodology, but I'll mention just one at the moment. Uh, John Berger's uh, seminal work on ways of seeing the human gaze on animals, he argues, is not innocent, but is complicit in a set of multiple relations. Animals are always observed. What we know about them is an index of our power. So in other words, looking at animals is not a, it's not a passive action. And Berger identifies four stages of visual engagement, uh, which he refers to as seeing, looking, watching, and observing. The most intense of these acts is, he argues, observing because it implies sustained levels of attention uh, being paid to the animal. Now, the ways of seeing uh, animals are most relevant to this particular discussion, uh, though these are by no means hard and fast categories. It would be through the eyes of the hunter, so for food or, or perhaps trophy hunting or both, through the eyes of the scientist, in pursuit of knowledge or, or perhaps prestige, through the eyes of the anthropologist, wishing to learn the cultural and material importance of animals to the indigenous human populations, uh, through the eyes of the artist, uh, providing an aesthetic element, but also sometimes a moral dimension, uh, through the eyes of the explorer, for which there might be multiple objectives, such as furthering knowledge, discovery of new, or lesser known species, prestige, nationalistic pride, uh, and so on and, and so forth. And the viewing of animals as an amusement or an entertainment might also be a consideration. Now there are so many potential avenues that a, a study such as this one opens up, and so we cannot cover them all today, unfortunately, but we can perhaps attempt to uh, ask the following three questions. What were the dominant modes by which uh, John Richardson encountered alien um, animal species or you know, alien to him? With regard to Berger's ways of seeing, how did Richardson see the animals with which he came into contact? Is he merely looking or watching or does he observe? And what can Richardson's attitudes towards um, and experiences with animals reveal about him as a person? Uh, and, and also by extension uh, with regards to uh, 19th century mentalities and worldviews of the Arctic. So who is this guy that I'm talking about? Um, there's a nice lo lovely uh, painting of him so you get a, a sense of what he looked like. Uh, Richardson, he was the eldest of uh, 12 children, uh, came from Dumfries in southwest of Scotland which was then in quite a prosperous market town situated on the River Nith, which uh, leads out to the Solway Firth. His father was a brewer and he lived at 11 Nith Place in the town. Uh, and just incidentally, he lived next door to uh, Dumfries's most famous one-time resident, Robert Burns. And indeed, Burns's eldest son, also Robert, and the young John went to the same uh, school, the, the Dumfries Grammar School, now called the, the Academy. Richardson, he then goes on to study medicine at the University of Edinburgh. He practices as a surgeon for a spell before signing up with the Navy. And he took up several marine postings, uh, including during the Anglo-American um, War uh, of 1812. And he saw active duty with the 1st Battalion of Royal Marines. After the war, he decided to complete his medical studies and he, he eventually submits his dissertation on yellow fever in 1817. He sets up medical practice in Leith. He never seems to really settle to it though. Um, and so again, he's kind of applying for, for, for Navy posts 
uh, and uh, he gets married at this time to Mary Stiven. In 1819, Richardson is accepted to join an expedition, which was captained by John Franklin, the, you know, the famous John Franklin who eventually gets lost later on in the century. And uh, the mission is to look for the Northwest Passage across the top of what is now known as Canada. Uh, he was hired as a surgeon, but also to undertake to collect and preserve specimens of minerals, plants and animals. Now, on that expedition, on his first expedition, they, they did not find the Northwest Passage, but did chart about 500 miles of new territory around the copper mine by sea and by land. He also wrote substantial descriptions about the reindeer, the ptarmigan, the loon, the hawk owl, the hare, uh, some of which would later be included in his larger study, the Fauna Boreali. Some of his work on fish, botany, and remarks about the Aurora Boreali were. Um, also incorporated into Franklin's narrative of a journey uh, that he wrote in 1823. So then Richardson, he goes back to England in 1822. He gets another opportunity to return to the Arctic on another of Franklin expeditions to Great Bear Lake and the Mackenzie River between 1825 and 27. And he had more time, he says, on this expedition to devote uh, to natural history, making notes of the plants, uh, and the animals that he encountered. He was also assisted by another Scot um, on the trip, a botanist called Thomas Drummond. Now again, um, in terms of the mission, they had no uh, success in finding a navigable route by sea, but again they, they, they were able to fill in more gaps on the region, on the maps of the region. Back in Britain, Richardson sets about collating his natural history material into the Fauna Boreali Americana, which we'll come to in just a moment. Uh, in 1847, uh, sorry, 1846 rather, he is, knight, he is knighted by uh, Queen Victoria. And in 1847, uh, at the age of 60 now, Richardson makes his third and final uh, journey to the Arctic, this time in the company with John Ray. Uh, their mission on this occasion was um, to look for the missing Franklin expedition, uh, this, the, the Erebus and the Terror that Franklin had uh, taken out, um, uh, were, were they kind of set off from England and they were never heard of um, again. And uh, Richardson leads this third expedition to try and look for his old pal. He doesn't find him, uh, and so he goes back to England in 1849. He retires to the Lake District and uh, there he continues to write uh, quite uh, productively actually. He produced over a hundred publications so he was a very active writer and many of those on natural history topics uh, and, and also his experiences in the Arctic. He dies in 1865 and he's buried at St Oswald's Church in Grasmere and indeed you can still see his tombstone um, uh, now. In, in the graveyard. It's, it's very close to where Wordsworth's uh, grave is um, as well, in the same graveyard. Now there's lots more that we could say about this fascinating man, um, but we won't because time does not really allow, but um, his medical ideas, I think it should just very briefly be said, his medical ideas have since been acknowledged as very advanced uh, for the times, um, but it's really his work as a naturalist that we want to concentrate on uh, today. Now, in, in terms of, you know, where do we situate Richardson, um, he, he can be placed quite comfortably uh, along other pre-Darwinian authors, such as uh, Thomas Pennant, who writes Arctic Zoology in 1785. Uh, this, it should be mentioned, is not based on Pennant's actual observations. Pennant never went to the Arctic but he, he bases it on observations of other explorers and of specimens that had been brought back to Britain. Uh, John Lang voyaged to Spitsbergen in 1818. It makes some good preliminary observations of Arctic fauna. William Scoresby's account, which I've already referred to, highly influential. It includes a chapter devoted to zoology, uh, though not Arctic specific. 
Uh, on the American side, uh, John D. Godman, he produces a three volume um, American natural history in uh, 1826 to 28, in an attempt to document and classify North American mammals uh, based on his own direct observation of animals in the wild and also in captivity. And John Ray, who I've already mentioned, his narrative of an expedition similarly makes important notes and comments on Arctic wildlife, though he is, of course, better known as being the one to discover the, the sad fate of the Franklin expedition. I was a little disappointed to read uh, in what is an otherwise excellent article published this year on the Good Sir Brothers uh, from Fife and their contribution to marine zoology and Arctic exploration, the importance of Robert Goodsir's natural history notations in an Arctic voyage to Baffins Bay in Lancaster Sound, uh, 1850, was enhanced, the author says, as there was still not much published on Arctic mammals and birds in the decades since Thomas Pennant's Arctic zoology in the 1780s, which is true, but surely Richardson's Fauna Boreali was worth inclusion, and this author doesn't really mention them, which is really quite strange. Uh, Post-Darwin, we're not getting into that today, but uh, just to very quickly mention just one name, Sir James Lament of Knockdow, whose uh, uh, views on the natural world were greatly influenced by Darwin's Origin of the Species, um, uh, and very clearly evinced in his own writings of Seasons with the Seahorses and Yachting in the Arctic, uh, providing uh, the first account of Arctic wildlife uh, in the context of natural selection. Uh, just to give you an example of that, um, for the polar bear, uh, he says it provides um, um, compelling evidence of Darwinian theory on adaptation and survival of the fittest idea, uh, while he speculates uh, that the seal was perhaps an intermediary evolutionary link between a whale and a walrus. Um, he's not quite right about that, but he, that doesn't really matter in a way. He's trying to apply Darwinian uh, philosophies to uh, what, he's, what he's observing in the wild. So despite not uh, receiving uh, the full attention that I believe that Richardson, that John Richardson's Fauna Boreali Americana deserves, this work firmly establishes him um, in the first half of the 19th century as one of the great naturalists of his generation, um, representing, as it does, the first major empirical study of polar and subpolar natural history based on first-hand field observation. As Stuart Houston has demonstrated, many of Richardson's observations were of species that had never been previously recorded, or he's, he's adding a lot more uh, information to, to, to known species. The fauna itself, it was uh, published in, like I said, four volumes, the first coming out in 1829, uh, he didn't do this completely alone. He, he's certainly the major contributor, but he also had assistance from William Swainson and uh, William Kirby. And the, the books are organized to represent the four main classes of animal life. So they're divided into the first volume is on the quadrupeds, which is the mammals. Uh, Richardson was, was pretty much solely responsible for that one. Uh, the birds he does in uh, in cooperation with William uh, Swainson. And Swainson supplies some of the illustrations uh, for that volume. Uh, the fish is pretty much by Richardson, but also uh, uh, based on, on some of his uh, fellow explorers information that was given to him. And the insects, this was pretty much uh, compiled by William Kirby. Uh, and it also was reissued with, with another title so as a kind of separate volume in itself. <laughs> Richardson concedes that he was relieved of the task of describing the plants, uh, allowing him to concentrate his efforts more uh, exclusively on zoology, uh, when uh, that task was taken over by William Jackson Hooker, professor of botany at University of Glasgow, who edited the flora 
Borealis Americana, though Richardson does make a contribution to that particular volume. So his contribution as a notable naturalist uh, does not end with the fauna boreali, though that is the kind of focus here, as he also contributed to and edited uh, the zoological appendices uh, for the voyages of other explorers, such as Parry, Ross, Back, Beachy, Kellett, um, and Edward Belcher. One of Richardson's passions and specialisms was uh, ichthyology, the study of fish, and he goes on to uh, write quite a few books just on the topic of fish. Uh, he writes one on Australian fish in uh, 1843 uh, and one on British fish in, 18, in 1856. Wesley Coe's um, article on zoology in America quite long ago said that the developmental history of zoology uh, in an American context falls naturally into, into four fairly well marked periods throughout the 19th century. We, we don't have time to detail all of these, but just to point out the first phase, which is where Richardson really fits in this first phase, um, which Coe says is, is the period of descriptive natural history. Um, these kind of earlier studies that focused on the classification and on the habits of animals. So Richardson falls within that particular um, remit. And indeed, Coe refers to Richardson um, under, the head, under this heading as a credi creditable work. So he is getting acknowledgement from um, the American side. So we'll now take a look at some samples in the, in the remaining uh, sort of 10 minutes that we have to uh, look at uh, a, a few items from the uh, fauna boreali and specifically the quadrupeds. Uh, and then we'll look at a, a few examples from his Arctic uh, searching expedition. So uh, in the quadrupeds, Richardson, he defines the geographical range of, of you know, his particular expedition um, and the recording of species as those found north of the 49th parallel. That's the only ones that are included, species found above that. 49th parallel, which is roughly equates with the Canada-US border that we recognize today. Um, he explains the limitations on his collection, which he says were due to the extreme rigors of the expedition. Um, but although my opportunities for ascertaining the number of species actually inhabiting the northern parts of America were so great, a journey like ours uh, did not afford much opportunity for studying the manners and habits of the animals with the attention I could have wished to have devoted to that subject. The present work, though fuller than any preceding one, is to be considered only in the light of a sketch. So he's, he's kind of, you know, providing you with his, with his um, excuses, I suppose, for why he doesn't do this kind of more fulsome study of animal behaviour as well as the, the kind of more scientific recording of species. He goes on to say that during the disastrous periods of the first expedition, um, they were prevented from attempting to preserve any bulky objects of natural history. And after many days of walking through the snow, many specimens were reluctantly abandoned. Um, it was not a total disaster though, as the most interesting of the quadrupeds and birds collected on this expedition were, it, were eventually described by Joseph Sabine in his appendix to Franklin's narrative. The second expedition, he said, was more successful with respect to specimen collection and observation. Um, and it's on this particular journey, he's also, uh, he also has the help of Thomas Drummond as well. So that must have been a great um, help to him. And he was also permitted to examine uh, specimens collected by uh, David Douglas, uh, and also uh, Douglas furnished him with information on the habits of the animals, and, and also had access to Captain Beachy's uh, specimen lists as well. In the, in, in the introduction to uh, the quadrupeds, he separates the animals into lists according to their respective geographical territories, um, and again, we don't need to go into details about this, but uh, the, the one that we're more focused on is the polar sea. And on that particular list of animals, 
uh, which is the shortest list of mammals. Only nine appear on this particular list, uh, which breaks down into five carnivores and four herbivores. Uh, though he does point out this is not necessarily accurate because he has not counted the seals, the whales, um, or the moose, uh, because he says he had uh, no opportunity of examining them, or there were limited opportunities of examining them. Most of the entries in the quadrupeds are relatively straightforward scientific entries uh, where he gives, if known, the, the Linnaean uh, genus cl classification. Uh, any further citations to the animal from other natural histories? So he'll, you know, give, you know, if Pennant mentions the animal or, or, or Godman and, and Cuvier and so on. And a description of the animal uh, in terms of its appearance, its coloration, its dental formation, um, its dimensions and those kinds of details. He also provides additional notes on how he came to view the specimen. So if he'd seen it in the wild, if he was working from a live animal, or a dead specimen, um, or just from a description from somebody else. Occasionally he supplies other anthropological information on First Nations and Inuit relationship with the animals. And this is really quite interesting stuff that he collates here. Uh, such as in his description of the Forster's shrew mouse, which he says is the smallest quadruped the Indians are acquainted with, and they preserve skins of it in their conjuring bags, so it has a magical purpose to it. Um, or the barren ground caribou, which he says um, is known by the Inuit as Tuktu. Um, he describes their migration patterns, their size, their weight, uh, their usefulness as something to eat, um, and how the Inuit make clothes and uh, shelter from their skins. Occasionally, certain species are credited with particular personality traits. Uh, for example, the polar hare is described as skillful or and cunning. The Arctic fox has extraordinary sagacity. And the poor old Canada porcupine is described as a sluggish and unsightly animal, which I think is a little unkind. But the species that takes up the most attention is uh, various discussions on the bear, on, on, on the, the brown bear, the black bear, and the polar bear. Uh, discussions about um, what, is there a difference? Are they different species, the black bear and the brown bear, or are they just variants of the same species? Um, is there a distinction between the brown bears of North America and of Europe? Uh, and he comes to the conclusion that it is the polar bear um, that is perhaps the only species which is common to both continents, the North American and European continents, but it may with justice be considered a sea animal inhabiting the ice floating between them, between these continents. Um, he goes on to give quite lengthy descriptions of uh, First Nations bear, uh, bear hunting ceremonies, compares them with Russian and uh, Sami traditions. He does, does not, though, give any kind of anthropological details on the polar bear, which I'm quite sad about, uh, though he does go into quite laborious details about um, their hunting uh, techniques. And then in the Arctic searching expedition, which he produces quite some time later, um, this expedition when they're looking for the lost Franklin expedition, um, he, he he has a huge amount of information here, not just about the expedition, uh, but about natural history. Um, the animal that Richardson mentions the most, I should point out, is not Nanook, it's not the mighty polar bear, it's not the walrus, it's not even the fox or the caribou, uh, or even a bird. It is a humble insect uh, that gets th the most uh, mention in this study, and it's that, it's the mosquito. <laughs> which um, usually uh, in passages to describe how utterly annoying and frustrating uh, and miserable they made their lives. Lots and lots of notations on that. And in fact, you find yourself, when you're reading it, you start scratching because it's just, you, you're starting to empathize with what, uh, with what they're experiencing. The vast majority of animal notices are about animals that you can eat uh, or scientific descriptions of particular species um, or corrections of uh, work, that, of, of information that he'd given in the Fauna Borealis um, uh, or you know, updates on information 
of other uh, natural historians um, as well. That said, uh, Richardson, he, he seems almost exasperated or confused at times by what he perceived to be the indifference of the native population, as he puts it, to almost every animal that does not yield food or fur or otherwise contribute to their comfort, which I find quite a curious statement because uh, he himself displays that uh, particular um, attitude. He does in one passage, quite an uncharacteristic slip, he does slightly anthropomorphize um, this little bird here, the white crowned sparrow, um, in describing its whistles as being like the first bar of, oh dear, what can the matter be, as if played on a piccolo fife. And it, that, that might just seem, he's just trying to describe it, but he doesn't do that very often. And so this passage kind of um, stands out somewhat. Usually the value of animals um, is equated with the presence their presence um, um, and ac access to animals. So, uh, you know, valuable land is a land that has access to animals. And he, he says that the Inuit also um, show this uh, very clearly. So what can we say in terms of uh, conclusion? I see my time is up, so I better get to the chase here. Um, by way of conclusion, if I can try and answer some of these questions that I started with, you know, what are the dominant modes by which he encounters animals? Richardson's natural histories uh, were developed from his experiences, his own direct experiences on expedition. Therefore, we might say that animals were a subsidiary interest uh, to the main goals of the expedition. But um, the amount of coverage that he gives to natural history in his written work is really quite uh, noticeable. And so, although he says they are subsidiary, um, he's kind of fighting with himself on this. I, I would say that it, it, it's actually not subsidiary, that really what he wants to do is be writing a natural history, and the expeditionary narrative is almost secondary. Um, with regards to his ways of seeing, does he does he you know look or watch or observe? Uh, first and foremost, I would say that Richardson's ways of seeing animals are, are very much through the eyes of the scientist uh, in pursuit of knowledge. Uh, this is his number one priority and overall approach to the natural world. Uh, therefore, uh, thereafter, he also shows an interest in animals mainly for practical reasons of survival, so through the eyes of the hunter for food. And to quite a surprising degree, through the eyes of the anthropologist, um, wishing to learn the cultural and material importance of animals to the indigenous populations. Now, if we were to compare, compare him with John Ray, um, I have found Richardson to have a no or very few tendencies towards anthropomizing um, the animals he observes. Um, and he does not speculate about their emotional lives at all something that Ray does actually quite a lot. So the two men are, are very different in this respect. Richardson is very much the collector of specimens and of facts, though he does comment on not having time or opportunity to properly observe animal behavior. Um, though I do get the impression that this might be an excuse to cover up his own failings in this department. Uh, Richardson looks, he watches, but perhaps his observational skills are uh, not as well honed with respect to animal behavior. And then finally, what can his attitudes and experiences with animals reveal about him as an individual? And this is a big question uh, and one that I cannot satisfactorily answer, uh, at least not yet. But what I could say is that Richardson um, had a calm and meth methodical approach to the natural world. His attention to detail is exemplary, and he made an outstanding contribution to knowledge about flora and fauna of the Arctic and subarctic regions of Canada. As an individual, he wanted to be acknowledged as a serious scientist and explorer. Though not the focus of this paper, he also contributed massively to indigenous studies as well, and is actually um, really very. Um, 
I would say is quite progressive in his views about the Inuit and the First Nations peoples, if we compare with comments found elsewhere. Now with that, I think I shall rest my case because I do not want to extend my time any further. So I thank you for your attention and I look forward to uh, chatting with you later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisanne. Very, very interesting. I've been sitting there um, looking to uh, put together some questions for myself, but we've actually got uh, some questions come in through the Q and A um, from um, attendees. So I'll put um, them to you, um, if I may, um, and if you answer to them um, directly. Um, the the first question, if I can get them back up on screen, is from Andy Dugmore, uh, who asks, "How did Richardson fund or support his very impressive studies? Was it through sponsorship, private means, um, a day job as a doctor, and work in the?" evenings and weekends for example so so how did he do it um my impression is it was through his own private funding i'm not aware of him getting funding from elsewhere but that I, my, that might be something i need to absolutely i need to double check on that but my impression is that he, he was quite a a well-to-do individual so he was self-funded in the main <laughs> Was any just as a follow up to, to Andy's question, um, was any of this actually funded through the, the Royal Navy or was was it not his not his work on well, you know, indirectly, yeah, because one of the tasks he had was the first and foremost, he was there as a surgeon on the first and second expedition. Um, but he was also to attend to matters of natural history. That's not unusual in these days. Quite often surgeons were also naturalists. It, it was a, seemed to be a kind of a good combination of skills. Um, and if you could draw, even better. Um, so you could draw, you know, your own yeah. specimens or, or whatever. Um, that was also seen to be. You had to be quite a multi-talented uh, individual to survive in the navy in these days. Okay. Um, question from Taylor Strickland. Um, did Richardson in short glosses or marginalia ever exhibit uh, mythical or traditional attitudes towards whales or other animals? He's got very little to say about whales. He, he, he seems to avoid them. I don't know why exactly, because he must have seen them and he must have heard about them and, and all the rest of it. So there's not a lot on whales. Um, and there's, I can't think of any, um, Kind of more mythical or ethnographical stuff on whales at all from Richardson. So I think the short answer is no. He does he does give quite a lot of mythical um, information on bears, but not on whales. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And the the sort of um, a follow up question to that um, is just labelled as Smith. Um, how well do his early observations stand up to what we know about these animals now? Well, that's a really good question. I'm not a trained zoologist, uh, but my understanding is that they, they stand up quite well. Um, obviously, in terms of his, think like, for example, with the bears, his classification of the bears isn't quite accurate, um, but he, he was really working on um, the, the information that was known at the time, um, they didn't, he, he's not seeing these animals in the, in the, in the light of um, Darwinian understandings of evolutionary biology. So in those respects, not so accurate, but in terms of the actual um, appearance and, and identification of species, he's, he's pretty good. He is, I think he stands up quite well. Okay. And a final question um, for, for you is from Rosie, and um, it's asking in his contact um, of linguistic particularities. What? I don't understand the question. In Richardson's contact with indigenous communities, yeah. uh, did he make any mention of linguistic particularities? Oh yes, he does. He gives. He, I, I didn't mention that because there wasn't really time, but he gives. Um, he gives quite a lot of vocabulary of First Nations and Inuit words, um, and, and including words that they had for the animals. 
so he'll 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 give you know wh when he knows it he'll give um a translation uh, from you know which tribes has the word for this and which tribe has the word for that um so it's quite useful from that respect probably for early uh like you know, if you're interested in the linguistics of of first nations people or anyway it's it's probably quite interesting i mean i i have no expertise in that so i don't know how good he is at that he did have with him um an inuit uh interpreter on this on the um on the third expedition so he was able to communicate quite well with um the inuit interpreter actually unfortunately drowned at bloody falls out at the copper mine um, in a hor awful incident, but um, they, they, and it seems to he seems to be quite upset about that because I think he got quite quite friendly with Albert as he called him. I'm sure that wasn't his real name, but <laughs> that would have been his anglicised name. Um, but he also helped him communicate with the with the locals when he when he came mm -hmm. across them. So yeah, I would say it is quite useful on linguistic information. Okay, well, thank you very much, Lizanne. Um, thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm getting messages great coming through. Messages coming through on the chat, uh, basically saying how much people have enjoyed that. So thank you very much, and um, a virtual round of applause to you. Um, very much appreciated. Now, okay, I will. Thanks.